I just really am so thankful to be here today. Um, and uh, after spending so much time meeting so many of you through Zoom technology, uh, so I feel like we're finally doing exactly what Gregory was recommending us to do in terms of coming together and uh, in, in, in humanity form and, and use it, leveraging our technology to, to actually get us here. So um, I really want to thank all the organizers. Um, so I'm going to give um, a, an update on uh, the mapping project and going to focus on uh, a specific aspect of the mapping project, uh, which is an exploration of what it means to be an organism and developing a conceptual map that can help us with the noosphere. So I think we all know that the map is not the territory, right? Um, and so, but if you're a, a European uh, explorer, at least having something like this might help you get started. And so just having a little bit of a sense about where you're going, if you're going to the Americas, knowing where the water is, knowing where the trees are, knowing where the mountains might be, what do you need to bring with you? This is sort of what I mean by conceptual mapping, that we're just sort of starting in that sort of you know, 20,000 foot view of trying to understand how to make a map of the questions we've been wrestling with um, here this, uh, so far during our conference. And, and I think so many of you may be familiar with uh, the, the, the mapping project that's on, online, the, the sort of geographic mapping of the noosphere, uh, which projects the technology and human populations over to the globe, that really gives you a feel for the, the scale, the massive scale of the noosphere. And what I'm going to focus in on in, in, instead um, today is this conceptual mapping that I've started to talk about. And what's some background? Everybody knows what a human cell is. Everybody knows what the human body is. So we should be able to do the same thing for the noosphere. You should be able to just get a sense for what it is from the image, from the map of it. And I thought, that's totally crazy. Um, and I'd really love to participate. How, let, let's try and make that happen. Um, so that's, the, that's, that's part of the background. But there's, really a, there's, a lot of there's a lot of inspiration that comes from both the story of the, the noosphere series um, and the science of the noosphere movies. So I would listen to those uh, as I was driving to pick up my kids um, from school. Wouldn't watch them on my car, but I'd get you know like 10 minute snippets. And over the course of a whole year, I'd really come up to speed on so many diverse scientific topics and language that comes out of the science of the noosphere to help us start to apply that to, to our mapping project. Um, one of the things that came out of the science of the noosphere uh, project in particular for me um, as since David just went through it so wonderfully, is there are so many big ideas, and it's just speaker after speaker of big ideas, and I thought, wow, I would love to see the, you know, the concept map of how all of these ideas are related. And, and so, while that's not exactly where we ended up, that gives you a sense of kind of where some of our goals are and, and what, a motiv what our motivation is for this project. And of course, some, uh, a motivation is Teilhard himself, and, um, and, and he uses a lot of evocative language about the noosphere to supplement our understanding of, of how it might come, come to be and, and how it is forming, the superorganism, the global brain. These are metaphors that are that evocative of models and, and also each kind of creates its own map in a sense. So what do I mean by this? I'm a neuroscientist by, by training and, and a psychiatrist, and so the global brain idea sort of appeals to me um, uh, immediately. And of course, Francis um, here has done some of the, the world's um, most, the, the, the most world-renowned work in that area. And so I'm sort of drawn to you know, thinking of, okay, we could make a, a sort of a, a brain-like map of how everything is connected and understand the information processing of the, uh, of the noosphere. That could be one type of a information map. And the other is the super, super, super organism perspective, right? Um, that, uh, that David was just sharing with us, that we might have a very different map about how is it that individuals come together to be functionally organized. And that might present a very different map. And in some sense, right, you start to see these maps kind of are probably also related, right? That there's a global brain might depend on the organism. The organism has a brain, and so the global brain might depend on the superorganism. And ultimately, in some sense, right, the superorganism depends on the organism itself. And so this led me to 
to sort of where this project really started to take off, which is just asking a sort of seemingly basic question, well, what is an organism? And to, to my surprise, even as um, a biologist, uh, it, uh, it, I realized that the literature is actually really unclear on this topic, uh, that uh, scientists still actively debate uh, how do we come to terms with an, what an organism is. And some have said, well, maybe we don't even need an organism idea at all. We could just do without it. And I've come to realize that um, the question, what is an organism, is a little bit like asking, what is life? And that wasn't exactly what I intended to embark on uh, with, the, with the mapping project. Um, but I just want to pause um, here for uh, a minute, because this is, this is part of my connection to human energy and how I got interested in, which um, we've all been sort of sharing uh, some of that through our uh, conversations today, um, which is this is a, a question that sort of I've deeply held um, and, and since I was a small child. And what, what I'm struck, what's always struck me by this question is that there's the biological answer, or, or at least the bi biological attempts to answer this question, and that leads you down a particular route. But then there's this sort of more humanistic, you know, what is the meaning of life to you, right? And, and um, of course, that takes you down a very different route. And one of the things we've talked about today is how there's so many different answers to this question. And one of the strengths of human energy and, and sort of what drew me to human energy was the possibility of, of it being okay to explore both of those dimensions at the same time. The biological, the scientific aspects of what it means to be alive and the metaphoric, figurative sense of what it means to be alive. Teilhard talks about the zest for life. What is it that brings us to life? Is that not just as important as what brings the first cell into being in the origins of evolution? Uh, so I forgot to mention, this is the, um, uh, this is the cover from uh, Erwin Schrodinger's book, What is Life? Um, and it, it should be telling that he's a famous physicist who sort of um, had scientists sort of called upon to sort of ask that question, to look into sort of the fundamental first principles. And so that's part of, part of our inspiration here is that, you know, whatever we're working on should draw upon um, first principles of, of basic science, but should also be sensitive to the bigger, bigger questions, the mysteries that um, uh, bring us meaning to our lives. Okay, so now just to illust uh, briefly touch on our, our goals for this project. Um, so it's to develop and apply a minimally sufficient model of an organism in order to model the noosphere. And although we're really firmly in the science track here um, in human energy, I think that what we're working on has um, potential implications and maybe a benefit to the educational tracks. Um, specifically as we think about developing conceptual and comparative maps across different scales to help, um, help people other than those of us here in this room understand and start to appreciate what the noosphere is and what a superorganism is. Uh, part of our goal is also to really delve into the research, to build a technical model that can help guide um, our theories for going forward. And we've also been doing some work largely led by Parham Portavud, uh, one of my collaborators here on this, uh, on this project, uh, in developing computer simulations to sort of, at least in its, give some sense about how, how this, how the noosphere becomes animated. And I'll just add, I think there is some sort of, you know, additional motives here that, that we can start to see the noosphere not as sort of science fiction, but as a potentially expected even evolutionary outcome. Uh, and that through our model and map, we might understand what's the state of development, kind of as we imagine like the development of a human being, its embryology and its unfolding. What where are we in the growth and development of the noosphere? And lastly, if we have a model and some simulations, we start to get a little bit more sense. We might see new connections, new relationships that will give us a sense of where we can intervene and perhaps consciously steer the direction that we'd like to take the noosphere. Okay, I'm gonna get just for a few minutes a little bit more on the technical side, so bear with me, but um, I'll, I'll, it's, it's still gonna stay 20,000 feet, I hope. This is gonna take you kind of on a, a little bit of a tour through the basics of the model that we've developed so far. 
and, and it's, it's in its early stages. So there's, there's lots, lo, uh, lots more changes, I'm sure, to come. So it starts from this sort of living systems perspective, living systems. And so a living system has both an internal and an external environment. And, and, that's, and that's mediated by the body. The inside of the body, there's got to be something that delineates the inside from the outside. And remarkably, somehow, this living system takes matter, material around us, and, and information, just raw data present in the environment, somehow coordinates this all and, and, and sort of self-makes, creates its own body. It's rather remarkable. Part of how this, how this works, right, is that the body can interconvert different forms of matter and material into energy. We call this process metabolism. We've talked about this already today, the idea that the noosphere can be thought of as society in metabolic terms. And then there's this sort of more information processing aspect where the body is able to use the raw data that's present in the environment to, to make the information of use for it in order to stay alive. And we're going to refer to these processes in general as communication type processes. And as I said, somehow, remarkably, right, the, a living system integrates, it coordinates these processes in order to sustain itself. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just walk through the, 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 the major components of this model and give some examples as we go through um, different types of living systems. So metabolism. This is a, what, a diagram here of the intracellular processing in biochemical terms of, I think we have the, the Krebs cycle, glycolysis. Um, these are all the things you probably didn't want to memorize in biochemistry class, right? This is the intracellular networks that um, coordinate and interconvert matter and, and energy. And as we scale that up into the multicellular organism, where this is a human body, we can see that each of these specific biochemical processes have now become specialized into unique um, and co functionally coordinated organ systems. And now, as we start to scale this up further, we start to think about the economy of, uh, of, of all of the globe, of society, that also interconverts material forms into um, and, and derives and extracts energy. If we go over to the communication side, we also see that very much like the biochemical networks that allow us to um, extract and interconvert forms and, uh, uh, and, and extract energy, we see this really massive and rich array of signaling molecules that take information from like the surface of a cell, direct it all the way inside and catalyze, uh, send cross, they call this crosstalk from one molecule to the next, all the way down into to the nucleus of the cell to help guide behavior. These are communication pathways within a cell and as we scale up to the multicellular organism, here we have a human, uh, human being, we have the same networks. They're just dramatically amplified in scale. We see the nervous system that is spread out through the body, the circulatory system that can send hormonal signals throughout, the lymphoid system that's responsible for regulating our immune system throughout the, throughout the body. Again, communication and coordinating across um, all the different tissue types. And of course, we know we, this happen, this, no surprise this is happening in, in, in the noosphere, of course. And so I'm highlighting here just the is it culture as representative of our communication processes. What's really being spread and amplified around the globe is not only um, you know, our, our words, our language, and our ideas, um, but our general sense about how things are goes, our feelings, um, our arts. Um, it's, 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 it's extremely rich, right? So that's the communication side. And so the coordination here of communication processes and metabolic processes are highly interdependent on each other, right? You, you, the, as I was noting the similarities between the signaling cascades and the uh, biochemical uh, uh, cascades, they're, they're very similar. There's a lot of crosstalk. Sometimes the molecule that is your signal is also your energy molecule. And I think the same thing is happening, of course, at the level of the noosphere. The, the spread of information um, in the economy is dependent upon our culture, our exchange of ideas, and there's this bi-directional and interdependence between energy, energetics, and information processing. And what is the result of all this? Well, it's that the body can, can sustain itself, the body of the, the organism, the body of the noosphere. And 
we can think about the production of the various diverse forms that, for example, a cell could take. This is a 3D uh, representation of a molecular surface receptor. Um, you just see the exquisite detail of these um, surface receptor of a, of, a, a, of a cell. And then we have, here's the eyeball at a multicellular level, just another exquisite example of the level of detail to which biological forms create um, uh, just these really powerful systems. And, and here, I didn't even know, Brian, that you had juxtaposed your eyeball um, with the Webb telescope, right? But this is, again, the same idea um, at, the, at the surface, at the edge of the organism peering out. What do all of these things have in common? Um, I think it's three, probably many things, but it's, it's three things. I'm, I would say that they're innovative, extrasomatic technology. I think all, bio, all technology is in some level biotechnology, and it really was inspired by Metaman to think that, to think that way. Um, and, um, but, and, and these are innovations, and uh, this, this term here, extrasomatic, which is perhaps a, um, a little jargony, but extra being outside, somatic, soma being body. These, what's, what's remarkable about um, evolution of technology, from, as you go from the cell to the human, so much of that is actually placed at our surfaces, at our membranes, where we're taking a chance to see, sort of see what's out there. So a lot of the, the novel mutations occur at the uh, extracellular uh, boundaries. And so I, I think we're seeing the same thing play out in the noosphere. And you put all this together, and I think we could say we're, we're, we're dealing with a, uh, what, what some might call an autopoetic or a self-producing system. Maybe you've heard this term before. But there's another element that I think is critically left out, and this is the last, the last piece I really want to emphasize in our conceptual model, and that's the evolvability of the system. It's not only that we're, we're undergoing evolution, but that the system starts to, in some sense, begins to kind of generically direct, direct its own evolution, that we sort of try to accelerate evolution. And so how does that happen? I think every organism is capable of that by creating a model of itself on the inside. It has a, something that allows it to um, store its memories and then to innovate, to test new ideas, and to mediate all of the other processes that are going on. And this last element uh, to the model we call um, knowledge or, or self self-knowledge systems, because these are systems that are really specific. This is knowledge that's specific to the organism itself. Just to explain a little bit more about what I mean by this, what's an example? Your genetics embedded in the nucleus of a cell. is a self-knowledge system. It has its own model of the organism, um, but it also is, is also coordinating uh, the activity of the cell, and it's innovating through the course of evolution, generating new mutations and changing the, the nature of the organism. The brain is another example of a self-knowledge system that not only coordinates our bodies, but is our source of our innovation and creativity. And lastly, that we may be forming something similar within the infosphere, uh, in, within the noosphere, uh, something that might be a global brain that might contain at its core a model, an image of what it is that we want the noosphere to start to become as a superorganism. Okay, so that's um, uh, the, the map that we've created. It's a conceptual map. This is a slightly different version of it that sort of emphasizes the, the networks and connectivity between the different aspects in, of uh, the systems. And part of the goal is that we could then apply this map across different scales. So, as I already shared, um, we could see how the cell takes on many of, utilizes these same processes in the context of its environment, its geosphere, but also its social neighbors, its multicellular neighbors, that we can apply the same concept to the human being that exists also in, within its biosphere uh, and within its social community and neighbors where the brain is now mediating the coordination of the rich networks of neurologic and endocrine systems to direct metabolism, and ultimately to start to use the same idea at the level of the noosphere, where the 
perhaps the infosphere may be mediating our culture, relationships between culture and the economy, to engage with our technology in the technosphere as we start to come in contact with our larger environment of the cosmos. And then there's this question, this open question that I have for maybe Brian or Clement, what do you call a population of noospheres in the cosmos? I don't know, what is the social community that might be out there? So I sort of left that there as an, as an open question. An organism is not a map. Um, it's a dynamic process. Living systems exist in time. They go through development. They can adapt, evolve, reproduce. So just want to really highlight that although I have to sort of diagram, out, diagram this statically, this is something that's moving through time. But also critically, and this, I, I think this is really helpful for getting into the scale of the noosphere, is that the organism, all organisms seem to be moving, as Teilhard said, toward greater complexity. Um, so there's, there's never a single organism. There's always a community of organisms. Um, and they start to develop their relationships, perhaps aided by this technology that's just outside of them, that extrasomatic technology that brings them together. And that perhaps they may start to develop a model of themselves as an organism, and you can see we could continue to scale this up and up until we really get this whole hierarchy, nested hierarchy of organisms and, and hierarchy of being. And this is um, turned into a um, manuscript that's pretty close to um, <laughs> preparation, which I've sort of titled, titled Toward a Bioorganon. Organon is the name that um, uh, Aristotle's followers gave to his collected works to help organize a body of knowledge within philosophy. And I, and I think that these are tools to help us start to organize biology so that the noosphere is a part of that. It just starts to make more sense. Um, there are a few key ideas that I'm hoping to, to emphasize. The one that I'm, some that I mentioned already are interdependence between energy and information processes. The, the, the very nature of evolvability in organisms. And this idea that perhaps extrasomatic technology can help scaffold increases in spatial scale. So this, these are our goals and uh, continue to be our goals. Hopefully we start have, started, have started to meet some of them, which was to develop a minim minimally sufficient model of an organism in order to model the noosphere. Um, we hope that, that, that we can use a comparative map to help us understand and educate others about the uh, noosphere that we can perhaps use this model to help develop our theory and continue to do research in, um, in, in, on this and to build simulations. What are the next steps with this project? So I um, have to say it was a little bit glossed over all, you know, all the details. You can imagine the level of richness, right? This is, like I said, what I think, what I first said when I introduced myself, the massively interdisciplinary nature of this project is so exciting, but it's a little daunting, right? You know, we need experts in sociology, perhaps. We need experts in religion, and so that's part of the excitement, um, but also we need to do much more work to sort of see where things work, how things are, are connected um, in terms of viewing and understanding the noosphere as an organism or superorganism. Uh, there's also some computer simulations that we've been working on, and I think looks like I probably will have time just to, to show you a brief clip of uh, some of the work that uh, Parham has been um, doing to actually try to um, at least simulate some of the aspects of the model that I was just sharing. The last piece I just want to mention is, um, you know, Talk folk, all this, a lot of focus on, on biology, on life. Um, noosphere, of course, is about, in, in large part, about mind, noos, mind. And I haven't said a word about consciousness, collective consciousness, how um, that might come together in the model. And that's a little bit intentional because, one, I think that it was really important for us at this stage just to get a general, to get a first sense of the organism and, and then start to think about things that were uh, even more complicated from my perspective. Um, but one of the directions, like consciousness, one of the directions that I'd hope to take this is, is the idea of meta-consciousness and, and identity. So we, I emphasize that our organism model is, has this knowledge base, and, and all organisms have knowledge, but humans have meta-knowledge, meta meta-consciousness. We know that we know. We know that we are a self and we can know that 
uh, reflect on those processes, and that allows us to come into new relationships with our, uh, uh, our neighbors, our community, those around us, the other. And, and I think one of the big challenges that's come up again and again so far, even today in our conferences, how do we start to see that individual self in the larger context of that, of the self that might be forming as the noosphere? That what is the self of the noosphere? How do I relate to that? And I think here's just one way starting to, to think about that. We've frequently used the multicellular cellular, um, uh, an, uh, comparison here. Cells form all of these diverse phenotypes, what biologists call phenotypes. They take on all these unique roles within multicellular systems. And I think as human beings, we do that too. We do that as our professional jobs, but we also do that in terms of what are the things that you know, bring us, what are, what are our lives calling, what gives us meaning. These are sort of our deep human archetypes. And I think all of those are um, part of the larger, uh, what's needed uh, to help organize the, the noosphere on, on a larger scale. It seems to me that the idea that you need multiple organisms is is not absolute because it depends on the vulnerability. Clearly, if you have individuals that are vulnerable, then you need lots of copies. And but if you have an environment that's relatively stable or there isn't that vulnerability, then it seems to me that you could have one organism, especially at any particular moment in time, you can have expansion. Mm -hmm. I, I was grappling with that because of thinking of there being a single global entity. Yeah. You're not going to get multiple ones until you start moving out into space in some way. Well, what is your what is your thinking about? You know, you've, you've undoubtedly looked at that and thought about it as well. A, a, a little bit. Um, so. I think and just to re make sure I re I'll rephrase your question to make sure I understand it. Um, the that there's the possibility that what's developing on a global scale is just a single organism, that it need not be composite. Is that what you mean? May, may not need to be uh, multiple, may not, there may not have to be multiple versions, and that it oh, could potentially change and evolve without the replacement of the entire unit. In other words, you don't have to have a cycle of birth and death in order to evolve. You can imagine a situation where there that internal evolution of components. I just yeah, I think you're. I mean, I think you're right um, in the sense that uh, you could any of the evolutionary and biological pressures and systems that we've just have been discussing could exist, right, um, in, in a single organism that didn't have any companions, so to speak. That I think now I understand, um, but it's pretty unprecedented, right? There's not very many examples of this. And so it, it raises, I think, really interesting questions about what is the state of noospheric development? And um, one, of the, one of the ideas that we've floated in our discussions is that, um, that the developmental perspective might be really helpful here, that we may be much more like an embryo than a, um, you know, a fully formed being in some sense. We're highly dependent upon the geosphere and the biosphere in order to survive in the same way, right? That uh, an embryo is dependent upon its mother for survival. And I think the same thing is probably true at the, at the noosphere level. And so it would be kind of like in some sense, when does it give birth? I don't know. What, and and um, so it's a... That, I think that, 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 that to me is, is part, of, part of that question, because I don't know, when do you create a singular organism, right, in, in the absence of any others? That there's that first instant, right? David? Yeah, if I could contribute to that, I think a lot of cultural evolution takes place <clears throat> as a decision-making process. In everyday language, what we do, if you're trying to improve something, so that's our target of selection, we review alternatives, that's the variation, and the selection is the alternative we think might work. And then we iterate that process again and again and again. So the, so the, the, the process of cultural evolution is a decision-making process with a certain target of selection. Once we understand that, then the target of selection can easily be, be global. We can say we're, our target of selection is the welfare of the whole earth. What's our alternative? We'll try this. Look at its impact. We'll try that. And so you could have a process of selection at the scale of the whole Earth without needing interplanetary selection. The, the, the alternatives are basically are the alternatives of a decision-making process. And, and so once you understand that, 
then planetary level selection is no more difficult to understand than lower level entities, a smart city or a smart town or any decision. So I went through that fast, but I think that it does solve the problem. How can there be planetary level of selection without an actual process of selection among planets? And, and then in that case, reproduction can just be asexual, yeah. budding, essentially, which happens for many. Right. Persistent, you can look at it like an organism is persistent if it continually right. buds. Well, some say that right, the bacteria have already hijacked us to do that when we send probes out into the, you know, into the cosmos, right? So uh, I would grapple a lot with the idea of the inside and the outside, and it seems to me that there's no need for a continuous internal body. In other words, if it can support it, there's no reason that you couldn't have components that are separated spatially, and so. Yeah, there's an inside and an outside, but it's not continuous. It's not all part of the same. Yeah, I was sensitive to your, your comment about that in terms of the membrane as you were discussing the superorganism. And I, um, I very much agree and, and also, you know, would emphasize also that um, humanity, we, um, I mean, first of all, right, if you think about our, our gut, right, I mean, that's, it's inside of us, but it's still also kind of outside the body, right? Everything that goes through our gut is still, you know, it's connect. It's it's an inside-outside interface. But even though it's all inside, and it gets can get kind of com complex that way. But the same thing works in the level of the nervous system, right? In terms of what my what I identify as my boundary of my physical space um, may not be my literal body. It could be more of a virtualized representation of. The, the space around me, who's coming into my or my space physically, but also then my sphere of influence, right? That could also be more symbolic or virtually mediated. So I, you're right, I don't think we need to always have a literal physical boundary. So I wanna really thank everybody um, on, the, on, the, on the mapping team, um, Parham, Rick, Boris, Clement, Terry, uh, and of course, Ben, and everybody here at Human Energy that has been, have been so inspiring on this project. So thank you all very much.